the NASA Academic Mission Services Aviation Data Science Seminar Series. Thank you all for attending. We have a special guest here today, Ella Etkins from University of Michigan, uh, where she directs Autonomous Airspace System Lab um, and is the director of the graduate programs for Robotics Institute. And her research is in the area of aerospace systems, autonomy, and safety. And so with that, I'd like to um, have you uh, welcome her today. And then after this, we'll have uh, time for question and answer. And if anybody wants to join us for a collaborative session at 145 uh, in room 141, please do so. With that, let's welcome Ella. Thank you. So this title is just about as general as you could possibly be. That means I'm going to talk about a bunch of different things because I don't know what you guys are most interested in. So I'm going to be kind of high level with all four of them. But then if you want to raise your hand and stop me, or I don't know, however that works online, please do so. And I'm happy to offer more detail, at least in words, if not videos or slides. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is what is urban air mobility and how do we get there? And then two topics in aviation safety. The first one is in contingency management, which is something my group has been looking at for about 20 years, specifically emergency flight planning. Uh, the third one is in looking at override systems. Traditionally, the crew has been able to override the autonomy or automation at all steps, meaning that it's really just automation, not autonomy, because autonomy has more authority. So this system is looking at a more general class of runway overrun protection, uh, envelope protection systems that would work all the time. Uh, the last one is looking at dynamic airspace geofencing, which may or may not fit in well with UTM, but it's always fun to talk about things like that here among the people who created UTM. This first slide comes straight from a paper that was written by some folks at NASA, Langley, not Ames. Uh, which is basically just looking at the functions that you are looking to automate. Uh, perception, decision making, warning and informing a crew member or other automation units, um, acting to make sure you maintain stability, don't hit stuff, uh, limits, meaning that you don't exceed constraints that could compromise the structure, uh, result in unavoidable crashes due to being too close to terrain or out of the flight envelope, and then integrating everything. Um, it's relatively easy to certify components, it's relatively hard to put them into a greater system and certify the whole thing. So Nadine Sarder and I at the University of Michigan had a project through NIA at NASA Langley last year where we spent the whole year looking at pathways to go from now to fully autonomous urban air mobility or more generally advanced aerial mobility because I think even though the UAM acronym is catchy and here in Northern California Maybe this is the best place for urban air mobility that I know of for a variety of reasons. We can talk about them later if you'd like to, uh, but you probably already know them. Um, there really is a more general case to not just fly over cities. So when you think of logistics, companies like UPS, for example, would love to have these same platforms that are taking four to eight to 10 people, maybe up to 15, uh, between points in an urban space and take packages to towns that are not right now uh, served by airplanes. So how do we get there? Well, one of the paths is called the piloted aircraft path. And these are intuitively obvious, but it's hard not to go on one of these paths. We were originally tasked with coming up with five to 10 pathways, and we stubbornly resisted and ended up with two. And the reason is you have to start somewhere and then build off of that. The two places that you can start are either today's helicopters, short haul, thin haul type airplanes, or starting with unmanned aircraft. Both of those give you a rich set of capabilities that you can then carry into the future of autonomous urban air mobility. You see that the diamonds are closer to now on the top one. That's because we already have some operations that are piloted going on now that will lead to the notion of air taxi at least with existing airplanes whereas we don't really have a lot of urban flyers that are unmanned. These are the phases that I think are hard to argue against for going along the piloted aircraft path. 
The first one is to go to simplified vehicle operations. There are a couple of workshops that were held here over the last year where all of the talk was about simplified vehicle operations. How do you take somebody who's barely more qualified than an Uber driver and put them in an advanced aircraft and expect them to make it safer? I say that a little bit facetiously, but I don't mean it that way. Not all of our pilots are going to be like Sully. And if we proliferate these vehicles to be in the millions over time, the challenge that we have now to find well-trained pilots is only going to get tremendously worse, which means that if we have simplified vehicle operations, it doesn't mean that we are going to have pipelines of well-qualified pilots. It means that we're going to take 20-year-olds who are driving Uber taxis and put them in an airplane. So that means that whatever decision-making they do has to be consistent but with what you could teach an Uber driver. Once you get to that point and you get to the safety pilot point, then you have the person out of the loop in terms of the situational awareness that would come with being in the vehicle, and then you have the end state, which would be autonomous flight. Now let me back up a little bit and say that Nadine would be very upset with the way I portrayed the pilot. Right, so I am aware that what this really is looking at, given that we want to have a level of safety that's comparable to commercial aircraft flight, is that we're not going to have the Uber driver who's 20 years old be an SVO pilot. We're instead going to take somebody who might be a short haul cargo pilot right now building up hours to be in the Delta jet that I was flying in yesterday and let them have this alternate path. Maybe some of the safety pilots come from the military community where they've been flying drones for 10 years. So you're still going to have people that are qualified. It's just they're not going to be qualified through the same route with the same training. So that raises a lot of questions in what training do they need? I always give what I hope are thought-provoking uh, points with controversy. My hypothesis here is that the SVO and safety pilot of the future need more background in computer science than they need in stick and rudder flight. Right, that's a big paradigm shift and it doesn't sit well with the existing community of experts. The reason they need that is because they need to understand state machines and the transitions between them in a way that goes well beyond memorizing what the training manual says. They need to understand the dynamics of perception systems and when they go wrong. What is it that that video or that LIDAR system is telling them and why? If we're going to put things like neural networks on board a next generation SVO aircraft or pipe that data to the safety pilot, what does it even mean to put someone in charge of that plane who's never run a deep learning network to understand what it means when it only works 99% of the time or less? That's why they're there. But that also means they need to understand that type of emergency where the data has not been processed correctly more than they need to understand how to push the rudder pedals and move the sticks. Suppose we come instead from the pilotless aircraft path. This is the route where there's never a pilot on board. I'm showing some more sophisticated pictures of UAVs here, like the Econa platform. You're not going to come from the quadcopter. You're going to come from the best of the best that's quite costly right now. And the reason for that is that you need those advanced sensing systems. You need to fly beyond line of sight. And you need the triple redundancy that you get. So you need redundancy, resilience, diversity, all of the things that will lead an autonomous system to having the level of safety that you expect. And then you push on it to the point where you can fly it over cities and then ultimately fly it with people. Now, are you ever going to have personnel that are well-trained on board vehicles of this type? I would claim yes, but they're not the pilot. They're the flight attendant. And the reason that I would claim that that is the case is that we're going a pathway here where the pilot does not need to sit there monitoring instruments because we have pushed the autonomy to the level where it can be at least as safe. But we do have to deal with arbitrary people on board who may be panicked, who may have emergencies, medical emergencies or whatever. And it's going to be hard for the system not to handle, or for an autonomous system to recognize and handle all of those cases. 
Now, I think that we can go um, down a pathway where eventually it is only the passengers that are on board, in which case people have to sign all kinds of waivers because there would be cameras and other sensors trying to monitor them to make sure they're okay. But this is some of the questions right now that are not being asked and need to be as we go down these two pathways. That's what I wanted to talk about in those two slides. Questions or comments? I don't want this to be a one-way talk. Yes? In this path towards sophistication, um, and we're talking about safety, safety, human safety, um, are you also exploring IT, um, cybersecurity safety? Yeah, so uh, I have... Okay, so the question was, along these pathways, are we exploring problems like cybersecurity? That's a beautiful question because it leads into my next slide. Thank you. Uh, this is what can go wrong at a very high level. It includes but is not limited to uh, security against uh, cyber attacks on the data link and then internal communication systems. Obviously, hacks on the software would be included in that as well. Um, I think the idea with this diagram is it's intentionally supposed to scare you. The timelines that we're looking at are 20 years, and I don't think that that's going to get shorter, both because we need to actually build these technologies right, and you guys are the ones to help make sure industry does that, and also because policy is going to be hard to change so that you get all of these autonomous vehicles to actually be welcomed into the airspace with data links as opposed to voice-based air traffic control, which is going to be essential for these vehicles. Yes. Um, even in this one, you're really looking at the autonomy uh, and the safety of a single vehicle. And at least we have some experience in doing that uh, in the space sciences. How are, you, how are these ideas going to uh, extend when you have uh, multiple vehicles in a dense, uh, you know, dense airspace? Yeah, so uh, I did not include any swarm or cooperative control slides here intentionally because there's too much to talk about in half an hour. There has been a tremendous amount of research on cooperative control and swarms, both defending the swarm and making sure that they function provably without hitting each other, et cetera. And uh, that research will only transition into practice when we have the ability to wrap these swarms with airspace that doesn't get penetrated by other vehicles. That connects to my last topic on geofencing, because then you can truly treat the entire group as a flight of one. Um, my group, in terms of the cooperative control research, has been focusing on things like cooperative payload transport, where you take many vehicles and perhaps in disaster zones, attach a hundred of them with tethers to a payload, which will be safer than taking in a manned helicopter with a giant rotor, just because if a few of them crash, it's not even going to make much of a dent in whatever debris is already there. Um, in terms of using swarms to organize the airspace, I, am, I think that it's worth pursuing fundamental research in that area, but I think that's really hard because then you have to have like vehicles with like missions. And if you have, it's the same as the air traffic control problem. In order to have 787s and Cessnas go into the same airport, you have to have approach speeds that overlap. If they're not similar enough, you can't organize them in a queue and expect them to successfully share the airspace. Well, now we're talking tiny little quadcopters that might organize in a group of 1,000 and urban air mobilities that might be carrying a family of six. These are not going to want to share the same airspace unless the family of six can just swat the quadcopter out of control and guarantee that it doesn't hurt the big vehicle when it crashes against it. So there's a lot of challenges, and I think that there's more discussions to be had on how the airspace is going to be organized. One of the things that urban or advanced aerial mobility breaks is this notion of UTM only going up to 400 feet. Right? Passengers don't want to be zipping in urban canyons. They want to be well above where they have a feeling of safety. Well, guess what? That's the airspace right now that's claimed for the commercial traffic. So even if we just look at fear of flight as a driver, we can't mix all of these big passenger-carrying vehicles with the tiny drones. 
And the tiny drones that are um, approved now, I think all of us in this room know enough about ballistic parachutes to know that it's not a perfect system to have a tiny parachute pop out whenever something goes wrong. My thought there is what if it ends up plastered on the windshield of a car going down the freeway, right? That car is gonna crash because he can't see. And so you lose controllability as soon as you pop the parachute. If you do that once every zillion hours, like in the Cirrus, fine but you don't need that to be your safety backup default. You need to have the active sensors and control that can save the vehicle whenever it is possible to do so. Let me go on. Question, uh, question on, yes. on the phone, if I might. Um, you'd mentioned a flight attendant and a pilot, um, and I thought it was very interesting what you'd mentioned about the pilots um, being uh, trained to handle data um, and I agree. I, has your research uh, touched at all on the, the, the new or differences between those people who control or help control these systems on the ground? Um, you know, a fleet manager, a dispatcher, something along those lines? Yeah, so in my opinion, a fleet manager is not going to be responsible for the safety of individual vehicles. The fleet manager is going to be focusing on the efficiency of the operations. So I think the training pipeline would be very different for those individuals. The person who's going to sit in this, um, let's see, the chair that you see in the safety pilot phase three diagram here is going to be someone who treats themselves as a safety oriented operator of one or more vehicles. And the more better not be too many or else the focus of attention will be a problem. So there, what I'm talking about is if we're not yet to the point where we don't need supervision to assure safety, then that person does have to be engaged and all of the cognitive engineering studies have shown that it takes a little bit of time for someone even well-trained to be engaged when something goes wrong, especially if they're not on board in the, in the whole mix of things. So I think that we're still gonna have the person as the safety pilot who thinks about the one airplane at a time situation, whereas the dispatcher is thinking about the fleet. Thank you. All right, you guys have been staring at the what can go wrong slide, and I don't have answers for all of the things that could go wrong, because I think that's bigger than one person at one university. Uh, but uh, good luck to all of you. I'm not going to end there. I'm next going to talk about one thing, one tiny little piece of the puzzle, which is the notion of emergency flight planning. Um, I've been looking at emergency flight planning since uh, I became somewhat obsessed with it when I got my pilot's license in 1993, because I, I learned in San Diego, by the way, uh, because I was really bad at selecting a landing site and actually convincing my Cessna to think that it was on the right glide path to get there. I almost failed my flight exam. I have my license, but it did involve the Bush pilot flight examiner diving down into a canyon right outside Ramona, California, so that we didn't crash. Very memorable. Anyway, and while he was doing that, I was like, we're going to die. And he was very calm. And he said, don't worry. You couldn't have been expected to handle that. You can still pass. I guess, you know, it's all a matter of perspective. So it's good he was on board. Anyway. When you have something that goes wrong and you think from the single vehicle perspective, there's a lot of things that you might want to do. This diagram on the right is the very general picture of that. You may need adaptive control. If the flight envelope changes in any way, the performance changes, then that's a good thing to have. You might need system identification to help understand what your post-failure dynamics are. Uh, envelope estimation, what can you still do? What are those constraints? So uh, in collaboration with others, I've worked on all of the boxes that have uh, red dashed ovals in this diagram. And there are a lot of people over the years that have done really good work with adaptive control system ID and envelope estimation. Uh, the next thing that we were looking at is adaptive planning and guidance. So the notion with that is instead of assuming that your flight plan is still possible, you change your flight plan to meet the constraints of your vehicle. Now it can be changed in two ways. One is to change the specifics of the speed, the climb and descent profile, but head to your original destination. The other is to actually change the destination because you either can't get to your original destination 
or the problem is bad enough that you don't want to fly for a long time to go the, to your original destination. So that really looks at the notion of emergency flight planning, which is uh, comprised of three different, or two different things. One is landing site search. That problem is so interesting because back when it was just manned aircraft, everybody wanted to ignore it. You want to go to a runway. Otherwise, you let the pilot decide. Well, in this time when we actually are getting a whole bunch of data to be put together, and we're also saying that we want to fly unmanned aircraft always under 400 feet, that's not sufficient. So we need the automation to help with that. The second thing is the landing trajectory generation to meet whatever the new envelope constraints are. This is a diagram from about 2002, which looked at manned aircraft that were trying to land at runways. So this is a, um, a very simple sequence of generating a footprint. The footprint generation was motivated by the space shuttle and other ballistic entry vehicles that can't go everywhere around the world. Uh, the footprint basically says, here's how far you can go. Once you have that, then you can pick out runways within the footprint, select those that are reachable um, with the aircraft given um, its current condition, uh, select those that are long enough, wide enough, that have emergency facilities, that have acceptable winds. You have a big multi-objective cost function there. Uh, you can prioritize them, choose the top one, and then build a landing trajectory. Now, everyone, this is a maddening slide, and I've been presenting it for 18 years for a reason. First of all, the people who are pilots are like, yeah, that's common sense, that's nice. And then I get compliments and I feel good. And then the second thing I hear is, you're in academics, there's nothing hard here. And this is where I'm like, well, isn't the goal to solve a problem, not to throw equations at people? At least that's how I started academia, but then I realized that that's not quite how it worked. So now all these years later, what I'm beginning to realize is that we're at a new era where we can bring the new data sources and it can be stimulating academically because if we understand what they mean and put them in databases to mix with onboard sensor data in a fused best decision system, we're gonna get the best result later for both UAM and unmanned aircraft. So this is uh, applying that algorithm to the Sully case study. This is the black box data where you see the climb out from the Hudson River. You see the engine failure just before the black square. The black square is where the flight planner would have started, which is about four seconds ahead of where it was clear the engines had failed. And then you see the descent to the Hudson River. It's a beautiful case study because nobody died and the pilot did the right thing. And in his testimony, he said, don't pay attention to the movie, go to the accident docket, uh, that he didn't have an aide on board that could help him. And so he couldn't have done anything else like go back because he couldn't have been confident. Well, if you have a basic, simple, geometric um, flight planner that meets the constraints of that envelope with failed engines, you can find that as long as you activate it in the first four seconds, you have three different choices of LaGuardia runways. You see them disappear so that after about 15 or 16 seconds, you have to land somewhere off a field of runway. Well, there were two issues here, and both of them motivate automation that still doesn't exist today in commercial airliners, although there is a, is it a Garmin system that's available now that will help you out with emergency landing, which is awesome. The first one was that automation wasn't on board. But even though it's very deterministic, certifiable, it could have been. The second thing is voice-based air traffic control. Sully couldn't turn back into the departure traffic from LaGuardia unless everyone in the system recognized that that was gonna happen. That process took longer than 15 seconds. That motivates data link. Recognizing cybersecurity problems, you have to add things like diversity, redundancy, and resilience. And then, if you have that, that millisecond of time that it would take for this plane that recognized that its engines had failed to alert everyone system-wide in the New York area that that had happened, would allow that plane to turn back. So here's where we've gone. Yep. Isn't there a margin of error also in a calculation like this? Yeah, there is. And if he aims for LaGuardia and would be 2% off, yes. and not just make it, Absolutely. crash into something hard. Yes, and you so set up but if my it's next slide. Hudson River, yes. well, water is equally soft. Yes. A bit closer to where you are and a little bit farther away from where you are. Can you wait about five slides? Sure. Okay. So. 
one comment, our emergency flight planner went halfway between best glide and steepest descent. So there was some margin built in already because that was a range. So what you're seeing here is the flight path angle that's halfway between. That means if you're wrong with the winds, that you can still make some corrections because when you have engine failure, there's still some flexibility in your flight path angle. That's all I'm gonna say here, but I'm gonna to get to your question. Because totally, right, there's a trade-off between landing site risk, which is absolutely gonna be lowest at LaGuardia or another runway, versus path risk, where you're exposing people under your aircraft to risk. And you need to trade them off, especially for passenger carrying vehicles. So this is stepping back and asking the question. Um, my slide changed here. Hasn't changed there. Oh, there we go. There was a delay. It wasn't as much as the air traffic controllers, but it still was a delay. So here we go. Something fails. Now we have maybe a small unmanned aircraft or at least a very well-equipped urban air mobility vehicle, not a commercial aircraft that doesn't carry special sensors to do autonomous flight. When a failure happens, all of the radar, LIDAR, vision, whatever is on board the vehicle is going to look around. If the local area is safe for that vertical takeoff and landing vehicle, go there. No question about it. 99% of the research that has come out of the academic community over the last 10 years has looked locally at onboard data. And there's some very good work in that area. That's what you want to do because unquestionably you'll land safely. We've looked at the other path. Maybe I'm just stubborn. Maybe I like doing things that other people aren't doing. They're called low-hanging fruit. As long as the community sees them as fruit. So then there's the map-based planning. The philosophy here is if we can take all of the cloud data that is available today and use it, pre-process it, not on board, off board, where we have time to do what we need to do with it, to make new maps, then we can use those on board so that we're not limited to simple aviation maps that were originally designed for humans, plus real-time data that only has a very small field of regard. So that's what this is, looking for small UAS, because that's kind of where you start before you go to UAM. So this started about five years ago. If you're under 400 feet in an urban area, it's very possible that when you look around, you're not going to see a safe place to land. So what we do here is take in GIS, Geographic Information System data, which includes all of the satellite imagery, a lot of LIDAR data, which has been collected at high resolution, especially over major urban areas. Europe is, I think, a little better than the US, but it's getting better in the US each day, maybe each week. We have OpenStreetMaps, OSM, that's coming in. That's an openly available source of data that gives you lots of tags on the data, like buildings and roads and overpasses, tons of data like that, land use type. There's this box called Census and Cell that has silhouettes of people next to it. The reason to have that data is to get a map of occupancy on the ground. That gets to this path risk question. You don't want to fly over heavily populated areas when something has gone wrong. And then the terrain, of course. So we get two things after we process the data. One, we get a list of possible landing sites, in this case for small UAS. It could be extended for fixed wing and also a cost map of the environment. So this shows an example for fixed wing where we added to runways roads. But the roads that we added were from open street maps. They had to be clear. The traffic had to be flowing the same direction. That's why you see asymmetry in the road segments on the map to the bottom. And this, the, uh, there had to be no overpasses, power lines, etc. So if you take that, you put the footprint that came from way back in that early slide, and you put your aircraft in a location uh, where it is, and look at what's possible, you get a new set of landing sites, which includes roads. You can do that for anything. So in this case, uh, you're actually allowing your autonomy to choose a road to land on. Now, that's scary, right? This case study is the Bronx in New York, and it was motivated by a plane that landed on the Cross Bronx Expressway uh, successfully. There's a story about that I don't have time to tell you right now. Uh, nobody died. There was construction going on, and they flagged down traffic. So anyway, the point is this software 
chose the same stretch of road because that pilot actually did a really good job. And if you know the speed of traffic, which the pilot didn't, but with things like Google traffic data, we can. If we incorporate that, that into the system, you can actually do an emergency landing as if it's an entrance ramp because you can find gaps in traffic and go there, both with onboard sensors and the data from these servers. You guys are better positioned than anyone to have that kind of collaboration. I hope you do. This is uh, Milan, Italy. When it, once it gets there, I don't know what the delay is. I'm looking at Milan, Italy. There you go. Where we're looking at uh, occupancy maps, uh, highly occupied as red, uh, from uh, call detail reports and cell phone data. Those are better during the day, census is better at night. What we found from this is that we could build routes that give your emergency flight plans over um, lightly populated areas based on time of the day, day of the week. That allows us to minimize the minimum number of people to risk. Um, we saw some gaps in this. The biggest one that I'll explain, there was a World Cup soccer game during the time this data was collected. It's very hard to find this data. That's why we're in Italy. It was open for another purpose than our research. Um, and you saw people going into the stadium. You saw them leave the stadium. They disappeared during the exciting parts of the game. So the reason is clear, because people aren't calling. So that means that you actually have to have the same kind of dynamic models with Kalman filters or particle filters or whatever that you have in any other dynamics problem because you can't just assume that the snapshot of data that you've gotten in the last 10 minutes gives you uh, exactly the right population density. So then with small UAS, we went to roof shapes. And this shows, once we get there, a pipeline to go from raw data to classifying roof shapes with multi-stage machine learning. This shows a new algorithm, which we haven't published yet and which isn't showing yet, that uh, takes point cloud data, builds a mesh, and extracts the largest flat uninterrupted flight area on every roof. These become landing sites for small UAS. Uh, by the way, our algorithm, which isn't published, isn't uh, two orders of magnitude faster than what's out there now, so we look forward to publishing it. And if anyone's interested, ask us in about three months. The bottom line of being obsessive with that is that by having all of this happen with real-time li LIDAR data in under a millisecond, we can run it on board. So if there is any change in the terrain, we will notice it and we will change how we inscribe the circle accordingly. This next plot is the one I wanted to get to for you, which shows the multi-objective um, Pareto front. I don't know. Obviously, I need to incorporate this delay into my own pushing of buttons on my laptop. So for the small UAS, we had not only rooftops, but open parking lots and grassland and all kinds of other clear areas that we were using as landing sites. And we assessed two different risk factors. One was landing site risk, and the other was path risk, which you want to fly over a few people and not have buildings and a lot of complexity on your route. The Pareto front you can generate, and then it's a question of where you go. As with any good multi-objective optimization problem, you can never have the perfect solution. So going back to the Sully case, there were two obvious points on this Pareto front. I can't go over there because I'll leave the microphone, but the one that's way off to the right and bottom of the plot was the Hudson River. It had very high landing site risk. You don't land a commercial jet in the water and expect there to be low risk. The other point had very high path risk, but low landing site risk. You were going back to a runway at LaGuardia, which is a great thing for that airplane, but you're flying over people. So in the end, the designers of that autonomy, if it is indeed autonomy versus pilot choice, need to make that call. Uh, the trolley problem, of course, comes to mind. Here you're comparing the needs of the people on the airplane to the needs of the people on the ground. Now, I would argue that in the Sully case, since you knew what happened, 
your path risk was not actually as high as I was making it out to be. Because if you knew that birds went into the engine and you knew the glide performance of that aircraft, you didn't actually expose the people on the ground to all that much risk compared to the risk that you were exposing the people on the airplane to by landing in the Hudson River. But this picture is so important to actually get in front of the community. Right? It's not up to me to decide whether the Hudson River or LaGuardia was the best place to land. It's up to the community to decide because when you have urban air mobility missions and you can't get to a prepared vertiport without flying over people, even though something has gone wrong, do you want to stubbornly have it go to that vertiport or do you want it to ditch somewhere like the Hudson River before it gets to Manhattan? Right? I don't know. You can't know. This is multi-objective optimization. That's the point. So we've been doing a lot of stuff in Unreal Engine uh, to allow us to, um, you know, I don't think I can play videos. That doesn't look as beautiful as it looks on my screen. But I think the point to get across here is that the rooftop assets, which we added to Unreal Engine, by the way, and they're statistically distributed in the same way as Midtown Manhattan, um, this allows us to get additional data, um, we all know the dangers of training neural networks with simulation data, but we also know the dangers to undergrads of forcing them to sit in front of image after image and click buttons on annotation software. So this is one of the things that we're using. All right, questions on that? I think I can do one more module and then I'll have to stop, but I'd rather take questions on each module at a time. Yeah. The cases where you would pick something in the middle, because in some sense you either want to highly succeed on one factor or the other one, but not maybe miss both. Yeah, so for our small UAS, we tended to do that. So as I look at this plot of three, our software would totally choose that one that had the 0.2 landing site risk and the 0.3 path risk, because we were doing a weighted sum. And unless we made one of those, it, unless we made alpha zero or one, it tended to balance the two terms. Um, but that may not be what you want, right? Because then your choice of alpha dictates whether you go to the Hudson River or LaGuardia. And the reason that there's a big difference is here you're talking about maybe a five pound UAV and it doesn't matter so much. But if you have a you know, commercial jet, it does. UAM probably is gonna be closer to the commercial jet in terms of looking at this plot and just having it blow your mind, you mustn't have either one happen, right? We must not have UAM either have to fly over a bunch of people limping to a vertiport that it might not get to, or have it land in the middle of a river and possibly kill the people on board, right? So when we have the triple redundancy, the resiliency, the diversity, all of the problems solved, maybe this will never happen. But if it does, it's better to have discussed this. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm wondering how expensive and difficult is it to do these calculations over the flight path, the planet flight path for regular flights and then for kind of uh, accidental flights. So that pre-planning what could be the possibilities and then you can upload this in the flying uh, uh, with the device and see. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. And uh, influenced by NASA Ames, to give credit where it's due, they, NASA Ames had this workshop at the SciTech conference earlier this year where there was a discussion that really made the position clear that what the community wants is to have vertiports that are within reach of every point along the flight, flight path. So then you would do this problem before you ever flew and each segment of your flight path would be associated with a vertiport that was not far away. The assumption there is that your footprint is going to be at least big enough to include that vertiport at every point in your flight. That should work most of the time. However, if you have failures that make your footprint smaller, it may not work. 
also, if you have failures that make your plane scary to those it's overflying, you may not want to go to that alternate vertiport because there may be conditions such as fire on board where you can end up dropping out of the sky. And it's not clear that all of these alternate vertiports for urban air mobility are going to be flying over unoccupied areas at any point on your flight path. In fact, I would say that's rare. Yes. You mentioned in the Soli case that if you happen to know it was a bird strike on an engine, it could impact your decision making at that point in time. I'm, I see a lot of what I assume deterministic stuff here where under the assumptions, this is kind of how we think reality will play out. I, I don't think you have a you know, specific answer, but do you have any sense as to how sensitive this is to estimating the current state of reality and you know, in commercial aircraft, you know, can we really estimate that accurately, like in a given point, and trust you know the downstream impacts? Yeah. So you've used many keywords, uh, sensitivity, right? And we have done sensitivity analysis to say, hey, if the difference in what we expect for performance was different by five percent, would we still be within tolerance? And one of the ways with the loss of thrust that that plays into it is by going to the middle flight path angle for a loss of thrust situation, you have the you have the maximum ability to be wrong because you can either be more shallow or more steep. And that also means you can change your speed somewhat as well because they go together. Um, in the general case, um, we believe that adaptive systems will make their way on board because they have to if we have autonomy. Anytime we don't have these rules encoded, we have to have a person somewhere to say, here's what you do instead. Um, I have never collaborated with Nancy Levison, but I like one thing that she says, which is that we often comfort ourselves with probabilities and think that they're right, but they're not. And so we have to account for the fact that they're not. So the question is, how do you design your system? For me, the system looks like constraints. And those constraints should be as clear of uncertainty in the uncertainties as possible. So if we don't know the performance of the aircraft, if we don't know the performance of the environment, meaning winds and unexpected obstacles that we have to detect as we go along, then the best we can do is to try to wrap a conservative envelope around both and make sure that if what we're doing is emergency flight planning, we're not trying to optimize the performance with respect to time or fuel. We're just trying to get down to the ground safely. So it's a different problem than it is if we do standard optimization. So, so if I understand correctly, you're saying that we should take a conservative yet deterministic approach as opposed to thinking about things in distributions and stuff like that? Yeah, so no, because I'm going to talk about Markov decision processes next if there's time. However, going back to... Uh, just this slide, well, how, whenever it decides to go back. There's uncertainty in when the slide's going to change. Um, the rules that we know should be certified with confidence and trust. And then that requires us to understand when they may not apply. So I'm a big fan of applying the rules that we know work as long as we're confident that the constraints on our system haven't changed so much that they no longer apply. So that's at a meta level where you say, is, are things OK? If they are, let's use the deterministic certified system. If things are not OK, then either we give up and crash, like popping the parachute, or we adapt the system, whether it's perception, decision, or action, where action is usually control. And then we do the best we can, just like the pilot would. So all of the work in adaptation and machine learning is incredibly valuable because that is going to fill the gaps that are left behind when we get all of the deterministic autonomy in place and certify it and it's ready to use. But in my opinion, overall system risk is minimized if we're using 
the validated and verified deterministic logic for every time that it applies, and then only using the 96 to 99 percent confident machine learning type results when we can't solve the problem otherwise. And I know that that's a bit of a philosophy because the cleaner, more elegant solution is to let the system adapt all the time. But to some extent, that's one of the reasons I'm a bit of a misfit in academia, is because I want, say, flying more than I want a clean, elegant academic solution. All right, it is now five minutes before lecture ends. So you get one of these two. Do you want the safety watchdog or do you want geofencing? Safety watchdog, I hear in the room and nobody at Berkeley is jumping up and down and saying no. So the safety watchdog, the purpose of that is much like Toyota's guardian system, which does lane keeping, adaptive cruise control and the like. Um, and it is built on things like runway overrun protection and flight envelope. Although Airbus did not open up their repositories, we had to build things independently for obvious reasons. So what we looked at here were two models. One was a deterministic state machine model where the student manually built the state machine, which looked at actions and transitions and safety um, override events. The other was a Markov decision process model where the state consisted of the dynamics control uh, um, properties, I guess I would say abstracted to a way that it made sense for Markov decision process. That'll show up in the next slide or two. Aircraft health, flight crew characteristics, which is incredibly abstract now, uh, which are things like, uh, is the person okay or not, right, the pilot? And I realize that that is a very puny description of crew characteristics, but in the general case, you can put that in and then environment. So the actions here are do nothing, which is no up, or toggle to a different control mode. We looked at this in the way that a single grad student could look at something, which is not across all of flight, but for takeoff. Takeoff tends to be very clean and that there's a limited number of things that can go wrong, as opposed to that big scary wheel that I had earlier where each one of those things had so many different things that could go wrong. Uh, this is data that shows up on my screen that says what goes wrong, right? So this is from Flight Safety Foundation, shows the percent of takeoff accidents, uh, LOC is loss of control, uh, that involve all these different things. So the most common one was rejected takeoff initiated after V1, which is the decision velocity. And the second most common one is pilot directional control, which means that you go off the side of the runway. So this shows uh, an abstraction of the state space where the horizontal axis is airspeed, the vertical axis is distance from the start of the runway that looked at RTO rejected takeoff. And here the green states are good, the red states are bad. It shows if you're in a particular part of this two-dimensional space, what's safe and what's not. Obviously, you want to take off before you get to the end of the runway. So you have to be going fast enough to take off before you get to the end of the runway. If you're going too slow and you get close to the end of the runway, you're gonna run off. If you are, so you want to reject the takeoff. If you're going too fast to stop before the end of the runway, then you have to take off, right? So this is not a hard plot to look at, right? It's just abstracting it. And then off the left is looking at the velocity vectors of what you can do to take off versus reject the takeoff. So this is a state space in the Markov decision process, which allows you to look at specific places in the space where uh, you need to uh, do nothing, which is no off versus override. So in this case, uh, a case study that illustrates this use is an Emirates Airlines flight where the pilots wrote in the, the wrong takeoff weight by 100 tons. Uh, so they had a two and they added the tail to make it a three. So a perfectly good aircraft was not using enough thrust to take off as it went down the runway because it thought it was too light. So in this case, they actually went past the end of the runway. There was an over, there was an area where they didn't hit buildings or fences and the like, and they ended up not killing anyone. They damaged the tail, went back and, and, and landed. But in this case, this is showing uh, the red path is what they did. The green path here is where the takeoff, or where the, the watchdog would have decided that it had to take over and initiated the rejected takeoff. So the notion with this watchdog is 
it doesn't do anything most of the time. If there is a safety constraint that's going to be violated, if the current system, whether it's a pilot or an autopilot, keeps going, then it will take over. And I think this is very similar to ROPS, right? I don't think it's a lot different. Um, I just want to point out that the general framework has this as one example. So this is the philosophy I think that you were talking about, and it does have statistical models in it where you're looking at the probability that you're going to run off the runway in this case. And uh, with the state machine or the result of the Markov decision process, you can do formal verification. So this is still something that you can certify as long as your models are correct. This looks, up like, this looks at the lateral directional control problem, where on the left you see a Continental Airline flight that ran off of a runway, I think it was in Houston. The beautiful thing about the image on the lower right is that you can actually see the flight path because the snow is disturbed. So the pilot, basically, there was huge crosswind, and the pilot overcorrected. You can see that on the rudder pedal, the second plot down on the left, and they ended up running off the side of the runway. Nobody died. Again, a great example, because in both of these, nobody died. This shows what happened uh, with the uh, override system. You see the lateral displacement on the second plot down on the left um, becoming so great that the override kicks in at about 20 seconds. When the override system kicks in, you see the typical control response, which is to have a lot of control authority, but it manages to stabilize it so that it didn't run off the runway. This is something we've been doing since we don't have access to a lot of proprietary flight data, and obviously we're limited in how much fixed wing data that we can go out and collect because we fly in a big net with multi-copters that can fly in a big net. Um, <clears throat> we've flown other things, but not to this level. The point is that there are a whole host of accidents where we know exactly what the pilots were doing and what the states were, so we can test override on all of them if we had a chance. You guys could too, where if you have notions of how to override, you can pipe in what the pilots actually did, what the airplane actually did, and understand if your solution would work, at least on the cases that you had data for. So that's the end of this part of the talk, and I think the geofencing has to be skipped because it's now 12. Was there a last question? Any last question? Yes. So uh, about your model about NDC, um, the Can you, so I, I understand. About the small print. Yeah. yeah, so I understand how these can identify known kind of anomalies. Absolutely. How can they identify unknown anomalies? Something so one of the reasons that we looked at takeoff is that I would argue that there are no unknown anomalies. That is a bold statement, but look at this. This is 50 plus years of Flight Safety Foundation statistical calculations, right? And, and these categories are quite general. So if you're able to handle all of these on takeoff, and there's another set for landing, some of them overlap, some of them don't, you're making a really good dent in the cases where you have an override that will function properly. Part of that 20-year path is to show that these things that we know how to model and recognize can be handled with autonomy, even if that 20-year-old Uber driver decides to do something wrong while taking off. This will fix it. Right? And obviously, it's going to be different if it's automation that's not letting the Uber driver drive the UAM vehicle to start with. But this allows you to have diversity in the software and understanding of when to know that that software is not functioning as it should, which in turn allows you to switch. I would argue that this type of logic needs to go well beyond where it is now and that it can avoid at a meta level. Is there anybody from Boeing here? It could at a meta level avoid even what happened with the 737 MAX. And the beautiful thing about this, most people look at this and they're like, you're going to cause those types of problems, right? Because that was an override system. And it took over from a perfectly functioning pilot and autopilot and caused problems. Well, the problem is that system itself couldn't be the sole override authority. There has to be redundancy and diversity. And so the module that was actually asking the question, 
are you falling from the sky, would say yes. And then that mode would no longer be able to, to work. It wouldn't have the authority. So I think there's a real question in how you design these flight management systems from the perspective of system of systems. There is no one authority. But if you have simple deterministic watchdogs that look for conditions where anyone in this room would say, obviously that flight controller is not doing what it's supposed to do. You have a better chance of being okay with increasingly complex automation than if you spend all of your time looking at one authority and having that be the only one. Would a single failure fall into uh, one of, would a failure at takeoff fall into one of these buckets? And then what happens if there's both a uh, thrust asymmetry and a rotation no attempt and then those control systems start interacting with each other? Well, so this is the list and any of these could happen in combination. The Markov decision process that handles everything would not fit on one slide because it would look at those combinations of factors together. Working with one grad student, which is what I did with this, and by the way, this research was sponsored by David Smith at NASA Ames, um, it's a start. We aren't claiming that what we did is ready to transition in because it would take more than one grad student to make that happen. But what I am claiming is that there is a general philosophy of looking at override systems that hasn't been looked at carefully yet. And that is having multiple watchdogs able to monitor the others so that you never get into a situation where one automation module that is going wrong has total control or one human pilot that is going wrong has total control. And either way you look at those, these are modules that right now we have simplistically given ultimate control. And the system of systems design should not allow that. Yeah. Based on your expertise, do you think it's fair to compare driverless vehicle type of thing? research and the work and decision support mechanisms that's been around with the UAM type of Yeah, so I live in Michigan. And the reason that matters is that everyone around me cares a lot more about cars than they do about airplanes. So whether I like it or not, most of the day-to-day -day automation autonomy questions that I'm asked are about cars. So let me breathe deeply and say, I think airplanes are ahead, even though the ego of the self-driving car industry would swear it was otherwise. And I don't care who hears that. Because we have more data, more history, more certification procedures, the list goes on. So first, we're ahead. Let's not forget that, but let's keep working because we're not in a position where we can rest. We're in a position where we want comprehensive UAS and UAM operations, which means that we have to keep pushing as opposed to saying commercial aviation is good enough. Right, and that is, I think, the Achilles heel of the aviation world, is that we have this monstrous legacy, and it's very hard to overcome those practices. Now, what can we pull in from the self-driving car world? Perception. Right, there is no question, if you go to robotics conferences, 90 plus percent of the papers in computer vision, in ICRA, the International Conference on Robotics and Automation, and the like, have looked at large data sets for self-driving cars. And they're making remarkable progress, each and every conference. We can't compete because we just don't have the open data sets in aviation that they have in the self-driving car industry. So right now, I have a student writing a computer vision paper for the conference that has a deadline of tomorrow, so that's what I'm going to be looking at tonight. And he found his data set. He and a couple of poor undergrads spent I don't know how long classifying 2,000 videos um, to find accidents in egocentric videos. And as far as we know, it's the biggest accident data set that's ever been released. So that's exciting. And there are some methods to go along. He's proposing a new metric that works better than the AUC metric. And so by being part of that world, you also can understand what the limits are and the successes and bring that into aviation. So it's incredibly critical that there be cross-pollination of ideas 
and minimization of the ego from either side, right? So you guys are in the middle of Silicon Valley, and if you can pump information out of all the companies, that's awesome. My only way of doing this is by uh, having uh, conferences and so on, but there is a lot of information there. I would say that the self-driving car world is farther ahead in perception than they are in anything else. I think the autopilots are probably still ahead of the self-driving car control systems. Anything else? I think I'm over time. Thank you.